speak at this uh, conference. It is my pleasure to wish a happy birthday to Jean-Paul Brasley, and uh, I think it's fair to recognize that in the last uh, many years, maybe 20 years or 30 years, all of us have benefited from the many conferences and workshops he organized or he helped to organize in France and in Japan and in a lot of other countries, I think. So thank you very much for uh, your activity. <coughs> So my talk will be hopefully very elementary and I will state some results and also many open questions so it's uh, meant to be a pr provoking talk so questions are welcome at any moment. So we work in the polynomial ring and of course this is a graded ring <coughs> and we will fix a homogeneous polynomial of degree d <coughs> and we shall denote fj, the partial derivatives, and uh, jf, the corresponding Jacobian idea. So this idea is homogeneous because it has homogeneous uh, generators. So the quotient ring is again a um, graded ring. And this is called the Jacobian ring in algebra and uh, Milner algebra in singularity theory. Okay, and um, this is just pure algebra. And if we long, if we want some geometry, we can look at um, the corresponding projective hypersurface defined by F. And. <coughs> We can also look at the corresponding Milner fiber. So this is a projective hypersurface, uh, which can be singular. And this is always a smooth affine hypersurface. And it comes with a monodromy operator, which is very simple to describe. It's just multiplication by some uh, <coughs> d roots of unity. The monodromy is acting um, on the Milner fiber, and for for each x, it's just multiplication. Because the polynomial is homogeneous, we can write a very simple algebraic formula. Okay, <coughs> okay? and now, um, of course. Uh, 
everybody here knows that we have uh, the following equivalent uh, statements. Uh, the hypersurface is smooth. Uh, the dimension of the Miller algebra is finite. Dimension also always has a complex space. And um, the partial derivatives form a regular sequence. So uh, I will explain a little bit what I, what is meant by regular sequence, even if you know already, <coughs> because I, I need some notations. So for uh, any positive integer, I will define uh, a vector space of all relations of degree m. <coughs> this means uh, n plus 1 uh, polynomials, which are homogeneous of degree m, and such that um, I get the CGGs of the Jacobian ideal, so this linear combination is equal to zero. And inside here I have um, another object, <coughs> uh, is a S submodule inside the uh, the direct sum of all these spaces spanned by the causal relations <coughs> and these causal relations correspond to something like that <coughs> So if I have um, pairs i, j, i strictly less than j, I can consider this element here, and this clearly satisfies this property, and so these are obvious relations, and they all of us exist. And of course, um, this is a graded object, and I can consider the um, essential relations of degree m to be the quotient. Okay. And so this is a regular sequence if and only if uh, uh, the essential relations are zero, so there are no other relations than the trivial relations, okay? So this is um, the definition. <coughs> and there are various reasons to study such objects. So why, why to, to study such objects? Because they are um, related with uh, geometry, with many interesting properties. For instance, um, the space of all relations of degree m is just uh, the global sections of this uh, sheaf, where this sheaf is just the logarithmic vector fields. Along VF. 
And um, this object plays an important role when you study the formation of the hypersurface VF inside PN, or if you are interested in free divisors, uh, especially for curves in P2, if you ask uh, when such a curve is a free divisor, this object is quite important. <coughs> okay. And so, um, instead of using this um, very elementary approach, we can uh, use a, a little bit more advanced notation. So I'll consider the Cauchy complex. of uh, these um, <coughs> elements, this can be described as follows. So, um, Omega j are just um, degree j differential forms on um, the affine space with polynomial coefficients. So this is just a direct sum of uh, s times uh, dxi, where i is equal to, to j. <coughs> and for instance, here we have just s times the top differential form. And uh, df is a usual differential. And this is a cup product of differential forms. And then we have the following uh, obvious uh, relations. So if, if I denote this complex by kf, the top cohomology is nothing else but the Miller algebra but with a shift, so if I put here S, here is S minus N minus one, and uh, and so essentially our object of study are just the top cohomology groups of this Cauchy uh, complex. Okay, so now in the case when VF is smooth, uh, a lot of things are known about this object, and I will uh, recall uh, a result here. So under the assumption that VF is smooth, we know, we know all these dimensions. And you see that this is a polynomial of degree and uh, I use capital T to denote the degree of this uh, polynomial and moreover there are some duality which says uh, that uh, symmetric uh, components with respect to the middle interval are just um, have the same dimension. And um, this result is quite elementary, is not uh, much about it. The second part is quite deep and is due to Steenbrink.
And this describes the relation of this uh, very basic uh, algebraic object, object with the Hodge theory. <coughs> So uh, this dimension can be expressed in terms of some dimensions. So here is the cohomology of the Milner fiber. And um, <coughs> this cohomology has a natural um, Hodge filtration because uh, VF is an algebraic variety. We can take the graded pieces with respect to this uh, Hodge filtration. And because the monodromy is given by an algebraic morphism, these graded pieces have an action of the monodromy, and I consider the corresponding uh, eigenspace for this eigenvalue. And the dimension of this uh, topological invariant, which is quite sophisticated, as you see, is just the dimension of this vector space, which we know in advance. And moreover, you can use the monomial basis here to write explicit basis for these uh, spaces. So this result is very, very useful. Uh, and um, has a lot of uh, consequences. So now, um, <coughs> In this talk, I will describe what happens when uh, the hypersurface uh, becomes singular, and the simplest case to consider is when we have only isolated singularities. shall denote uh, sigma f uh, is a set of singularities. <coughs> and we can draw a picture. And uh, this situation fits very well with the title of our conference because we can look at some local invariants Namely, we can look what happens uh, around each singular point. And then we can look at some global invariants of singularities. For instance, uh, the position of these points in the ambient projective space will play a role in the story. And so we have an interplay between local and global invariants. <laughs> OK, and so um, to say that uh, the dimension of this space is zero, this is equivalent to saying that uh, in the Cauchy complex, everything is zero up to degree n. So here, the only interesting cohomology groups are these two ones. All the rest is trivial. And uh, moreover, we know for sure that uh, this is non-zero as soon as there are singularities. There are some interesting relations among the partial derivatives. And so um, let's try to find uh, such relations.
uh, when this singular set is empty, still uh, the, the, this last two conditions satisfy. So it's not equivalent to dimension zero. No, no, when when um, when it's smooth, this is zero. For smooth uh, hypersurfaces, this is zero. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the beauty of the subject is that you can do some computations, some explicit computations. Mm -hmm. I will do some simple computations by hand, but you can play with singular and do very complicated computations. So uh, let's consider a cuspidal cubic. Then the equation is um, something like that. So you can compute the partial derivatives. And you see that we have a relations here. So if I multiply x fx minus uh, 2y fy, I get 0. And so you see that um, in this case, I get a one-dimensional space of non-trivial relations. Okay. So now if you look at the nodal cubic, then the equation is uh, okay, and I will write you directly the equations. Not to, but you can check if you can check on me. And you see that here, uh, there are no relations of degree 1, but there is one relation of degree 2. And of course, in degree 2, we have also the um, Cauchy relations, but uh, the space of essential relations is of degree 1, or of dimension 1. <coughs> okay. Very good. As you expect, with such classical objects, there are a lot of results. But the good news is that there are also a lot of uh, open questions. So let me state a result. A theorem due to two pairs of authors, David Cox and uh, Schenk, and then uh, Laurent Buzet from Nice, and Joan Olu. So both of these results are around uh, the 2000. If VF has a only weighted homogeneous singularities. And of course, isolated, because this is our assumption. Then, then we have a precise description of the interplay between the set of uh, relations and the set of all relations, namely the Cauchy relations, are exactly the relations 
having all the components in some idea, EF is a saturation of the ideal GF. And this means a set of elements uh, A in S such that uh, for any I So is a ma maximal ideal defining uh, the same uh, subscheme as a subscheme of sigma f, <coughs> and uh, so, so you see that um, this is very interesting because if you use a software like uh, Singular or Cocoa, they will give you a list of all uh, relations or uh, vector bases for a space of relations. But if you want to decide which are the causal relations, it's not so obvious. And so this is a very useful uh, test in practice. Okay, and so I, I gave um, a different proof um, new proof in a paper, in a preprint, with uh, Sticlaro. And, uh, yes? What does it mean for projective hypersurface to have quite You look uh, locally around each singularity in PN, so. And some local yeah, exactly, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. And so here is the first question, which I think is open. So in both proofs, in both proofs, even the proofs are different, a weighted homogeneous plays a key role. But uh, the question is, does one really not, uh, need this? <coughs> we have no country example, and uh, this is uh, quite, quite interesting because if it's true in general, then uh, there should be a proof uh, independent of the fact that uh, the singularities are weighted homogeneous. <coughs> Okay, so uh, we have also the following uh, result, which is easy. Let uh, tau, tau of f to be the sum over all the singularities of the um, local Kirina numbers associated with uh, each of the local singularities. And this is called the total, total Kirina number. If I look at the dimension of this um, homogeneous component, uh, uh, for k large enough, this dimension will stabilize and it will become constant, but non-zero, because you have an infinite dimensional uh, object. The Milner algebra is infinite dimensional, and this comes from the fact that this homogeneous component will have the same strictly positive dimension. And actually, this is given by this number. And uh, this uh, holds for any k large or equal to t. Capital T is defined over there. <coughs> Moreover, uh, 
let um, minimal relation degree of f be the minimal of k such that the essential relations uh, of degree k are non-zero. And then the dimension of MFS is equal to the dimension of uh, <coughs> so F tilde is a um, generic polynomial of degree D, for instance, the Fermat polynomial, such that the corresponding hypersurface is smooth. And so these dimensions are known because of the first point in that theorem. Okay? And this equality holds for S more or equal minimal relation degree of F plus D minus 2. So uh, we know the dimensions for large K and we know the dimensions for small K and this depends, the interest of this depends on this invariant. And so from now on I will explain you uh, how to get some information on this invariant. So in this proposition you don't assume that it is quite homogeneous? No, this is quite general. Pardon? In the first case, Well, this happens uh, <laughs> very exceptionally. <laughs> But you are right, okay. <coughs> you, you have an example in mind? Yeah, but uh, if we assume that uh, there are really singularities, then maybe if, if we know that there are singularities, maybe this works like that. But if we allow smooth, then we have to put a strict out. <coughs> okay? So. Great. So now I will define some uh, local invariants associated with these uh, singularities. The first invariant is very elementary. Assume that we have an isolated hypersurface singularity defined by G equals zero. And then uh, I will define an invariant O of Y zero to be the minimum of all K in N such that the maximal ideal MN K is contained in the Jacobian ideal of J plus G and everything happens in the local ring uh, at the origin in ON, so MN is a maximal ideal here. And uh, for instance, it's clear that this is always smaller than uh, the Chilina number and uh, for a node this is one and if you know a little bit about finite uh, determinacy of singularities, which was a subject uh, uh, in fashion uh, 30 years ago, this is essentially the order of determinacy minus one or something like that. <coughs> but it is very easy to, to define. And that's why I, I use O. Now the second one, it's a little bit more complicated. Alpha of y zero is what is called the 
Arnold Singularity Index of y0. And it's also the minimal uh, spectral number. at least with some convention on the spectrum. And uh, to fix the idea, if I, have a, if I have a very simple local equation of this type, for the singularity, so if the singularity is a Briscoe farm type, then uh, this invariant is just the sum of the exponents, and here all the exponents are assumed to be at least two. Okay? And um, so we can uh, look at this invariance at each singular point, and then we can take uh, alpha f to be the minimum the minimum of all minimum of all these exponents okay so we have a number of um, great Okay, so now I will start um, to state the main results of this talk. So the first theorem is due to Morihiko Saito and uh, myself. And uh, again, we assume uh, Vf has only weighted homogeneous singularities, isolated singularities. And uh, I will spend the last uh, 10 minutes of my talk uh, discussing the proof of this theorem, and I will explain where weighted homogeneous uh, assumptions enter. Then, The essential relations vanish, so there are no interesting relations for k less than alpha f times d minus n. <coughs> so actually, the story of this result is as follows. First, we prove this result uh, for, the k, for the case of uh, plane curves. And then in a paper with uh, Dorin Popescu, we made some computations in general, and we conjecture that this holds in general. And after that, uh, with Morihiko Saito, we managed to prove uh, the result in general. And uh, so, as an example, if um, Vf is nodal, that is, it has only A1 singularities, then you see that um, this is zero for um, so you get uh, you have to go to very large degrees in order to have interesting relations because n can be large, d can be large, so it's not easy to find interesting relations for a nodal hypersurface. And um, what is interesting is that these bounds are sharp. If you look at uh, 
hypersurfaces with many singularities, for instance, uh, Chebyshev uh, of hypersurfaces, the bound is attained. So this bound, even if it's computed with Hodge theory, it's very sharp in this uh, situation. And it's also sharp it's also sharp for uh, the sextic, the Zariski sextic with six cusp. So you can make the computation and you get a sharp result in, in that case. And so the question here, again, does one need the weighted homogeneous assumption? And um, We have no counterexample, and um, the second result, which I proved myself, and this is very elementary in some sense, but uh, in this result, uh, we don't need this hypothesis. This is a good point. And the result says that um, uh, we have vanishing for k so uh, we have vanishing here is a very large coefficient, much larger than here, you see, but we have to subtract all the invariant O of uh, these singularities. Okay, and uh, some uh, remark. This theorem is also sharp for a small number of singularities. If you have a small number of singularities, for instance, um, For hypersurfaces with uh, one, two, or three nodes, this is sharp. In particular, if you have a hypersurface having just one node, in order to get the first relation, you have to go. Very high. So if uh, if this has exactly one node, that is one a one singularity, then the first relation occurs in this very high degree, and uh, not only the degree is very large, but uh, if you experiment with singular for various uh, values of n and d, you get relations with a lot of coefficients. So the relations are very complicated. And then maybe there are applications to cryptography, because uh, factorizing prime is also a question of the same nature. If you know in advance uh, the primes, then uh, the factorization is simple. Here's the same. If you know uh, the relation, then uh, um, you can use it. But to find the relation, it's incredibly difficult, because the vector space where you should find this relation is huge. <coughs> okay, and so of course one can ask um, uh, can one uh, find a general result uh, having these two results as special cases? This would be ideal, but if you have uh, any idea, I am uh, happy to, to talk to you. Okay, so until now we discuss only how to def determine the first k where this is non-zero. Now I am interested in saying uh, maybe how many relations I have in a given dimension because this is also interesting. And 
And uh, well, let me state the result somewhere. <coughs> So uh, recall that uh, sigma f is defined as a subscheme uh, by the ideal uh, i f, and then I will define um, the defect of degree k of sigma f to be this invariant total Turing number minus the dimension of SK divided by, where well, this means the K case homogeneous components of IF. <coughs> and this can be interpreted as the dimension of the co-kernel of some evaluation mapping. And the defect is zero if and only if the singular points impose independent conditions. So this is a standard way. And then we have a theorem, maybe theorem three, uh, and this is a global invariant because this depends on the position of singularities. The points uh, impose uh, independent conditions on polynomial of some degrees. If they are in good positions, for instance, three points, if they are not collinear, they impose independent conditions on linear forms. But if they are collinear, they are no longer independent. <coughs> and the theorem says the following. So we have again some uh, stabilization property. Uh, and uh, in general, this dimension is given by some defect. Okay. <coughs> And uh, as a corollary, which is interesting, uh, if sigma f is um, the singular set of a nodal hypersurface, then uh, a lot of these defects are zero for any k and so this corollary says that um, if I give you a finite set of points it's not always possible to find a nodal hypersurface of given degree having this set as nodes because all these conditions have to be satisfied so this has very nice geometrical consequences. Now, if I look at this uh, result, uh, you see if I have a nodal hypersurface, this result tells me that for large k, I have exactly a kind of a basis of relations in bijection of the, with the singularities, because I have as many singularities as uh, the dimension of, a, as the cardinal of a basis. And an open question is, given a hyper, another hypersurface, can you write a basis starting from the equation? Can you construct for each node uh, a relation? And uh, we, are, we have no idea how to do this. Okay. Now, uh, let, let us try to explain the, the proof uh, of this result and why weighted homogeneous singularities are important. <coughs> Hmm. 
Je l'ai à ma frère là et... I'm afraid I'm <laughs> a little bit late. <coughs> okay, so in two words, uh, there is a A1 spectral sequence starting with the cohomology of the kosher complex with some uh, degrees here and uh, converging to some uh, graded uh, pieces of the cohomology of the Milner fiber. So P here is not the Hoch filtration, but a filtration which is related uh, to it. It's called the polar filtration. And in down, down to our terms, this means the following. I have here some um, components of this. Um, so essentially, this you know, this is just uh, the minor algebra, and these are just the essential uh, relations of f. And I have here some uh, d1. <coughs> and then what happens? Uh, we have a result telling us that uh, Steinbrink theorem is still valid in this context if we look at uh, this part of the spectral sequence in other words in this part of the spectral sequence, the E1 term should be the limit. On the other hand, because the singularities are weighted homogeneous, this implies we can compute the differential, and the differential turns out to be injective. But if this is injective, and this uh, has to remain unchanged, the only possibility is that here we have zero. And this explains why I have vanishing for the essential relations in small degrees. Okay, thank you very much. For Comments? Yes, Fabi. No, I don't need it. They need it. So in theorem one, if you replace the essential relations between the partial derivatives by the relations between the partial derivatives and F, can you avoid the assumption weighted homogeneous? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, of course, F uh, comes from the Euler relation, so it's clear how the presence of F uh, changes the setting, but I'm, I'm not sure. So, I explain you here, weighted homogeneity is just used uh, in this uh, to compute D1 and to get injectivity. So, but of course, this proof is very sophisticated, and maybe there is some uh, different proof not passing through the spectral sequence, and uh, I, um, it's quite pr possible that weighted homogeneity is not necessary. Yeah. Any other questions? Why did the polar filtration come in? Yeah, because um, the polar filtration comes in because, for instance, if you look at um, the cohomology of the Milner fiber corresponding to eigenvalue 1, this is just the cohomology of the complement. 
And here you can express the cohomology of the complement with uh, rational um, differential forms, and the polar filtration takes into account the order of the pole along such a hypersurface. And so the order of the pole is exactly the filtration given by the order of the pole is exactly the filtration which produces this spectral sequence. The host filtration um, coincide with the uh, host filtration coincide with polar filtration if the hypersurface is smooth. This is Griffith's uh, main theorem, and um, in general there is an inclusion. This is one of my results, uh, Spear Delin, many years ago, and moreover. Uh, Morihiko Saito showed that in some ranges we have equality, and in this range we have equality between the two filtrations. And this allows us to, to show that Steinbring theorem is still uh, valid. Oh, I thought polar filtration meant polar in the sense of uh, Bernard. No, no, no. So this is just the order of the pole, so it's exactly. like Hodge filtration. Exactly. So it's like the Hodge filtration. Exactly, no? exactly. It has nothing to do with polar cars. <laughs> <laughs> So my question is about this diagram. Diagram is a global object. It can, uh, you work with uh, polynomials. You mean this, this yes. diagram? My question is, you said that if uh, singularities are quasi homogeneous, then some uh, differential is injective. How can you prove yes. injectivity yes. Yes. using local coordinates around yes. singularities yes. for global uh, One objects? can show that uh, this differential can be localized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is technical result. You are, you are quite right. This is global, but uh, we show that the differential computation can be localized, and then we use uh, properties of the local gauss manning connections associated with each singular point. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, any other questions or comments? What about D2, D3, D3? Uh, Yeah, so... Um, uh, the other differentials are very difficult to compute, and uh, I proved many years ago that this spectral sequence in general degenerates after a finite number of steps, which is not obvious because we have differentials uh, of arbitrary lengths, you see. And um, now with Morihiko, we, we, we are near, near the proof that uh, the singularities are weighted homogeneous if and only if the spectral sequence degenerates at E2. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Then we thank the speaker again. Yeah.